Our guest is Nirupama Rao. She's ambassador from the Republic of India to the United States. Formerly, she served as ambassador from India to China, Peru, Bolivia, and Sri Lanka, and formerly served as well as foreign secretary for the Republic of India. Madam Ambassador, it's an honor to sit with you. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Tell all of our viewers three things that they should know about India. Well, first of all, that it's the world's largest modern democracy, that it is a country of 1.2 billion people, and that it is, most of all, defined by unity in diversity. What does that mean, unity and diversity? Well, if you look at India and consider the diversity of the population, the number of religions, the number of languages, at least 28 to 29 uh, listed in the constitution of India, and much more unnumbered, but certainly out there. That is the diversity of India. And of course, the diversity of geography. You begin with the high Himalayas in the north, mm -hmm. and you go down to the peninsular part of the country, and which is very tropical, and the vast coastline. And that is what makes India a key Indian Ocean nation. Mm. So that is what I mean by diversity. <laughs> when, when I read 1.2 billion people and put it in the same sentence as democracy, I say, how is that possible? It is possible. We have demonstrated to the world in the last six decades, uh, a little more than six decades, that we've been an independent country, that we are a very, very vibrant democracy. And with each successive election, with each successive decade, democracy has grown stronger mm -hmm. and has taken even more strong roots in the country. Does the fact that uh, the predominant uh, group is Hindu, 80%, I gather, does that make uh, things easier? I would like to you know, recast that please, statement. Please. It's true that uh, the majority of India's population is Hindu, mm -hmm. but it is also a very important Muslim country yes. in a sense because yes. we have almost 180 million people who are Muslim. And that is a huge minority by any standards, mm -hmm. uh, which makes us only second to Indonesia in terms of the numbers of Muslims that we have in our country. Mm -hmm. So I would say that India is first and foremost a secular democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, regardless of uh, you know, which religion is in the majority, uh, we regard everybody as equal and it is the conscious policy of the government not to discriminate on the basis of religion. It's very clear, isn't it, in the Constitution that was written in 1950, as That's I right. recall, uh, that uh, the majority rules, yes, but the minorities are very, very carefully protected. Huh? Absolutely. And I'd like to tell you a little anecdote about the Constitution. We are sitting in the residence of the Ambassador of India, a house that we bought in 1945. And do you know that the, when the Constitution of India was being formulated by our founding fathers in India, we had people come over to Washington also to discuss with your Supreme Court justices and constitutional experts, you know, the, the future you know, framework of our Constitution. And it was in this very room that we uh -huh. are sitting that we had those discussions. Ah, yes. so how, how in the end did it turn out that the government of uh, India became either similar or dissimilar from the government of the United States? I think there are a lot of similarities. Uh, we are a union of states, just mm -hmm. as you are. We mm -hmm. have a federal structure. The state governments have a great deal of responsibilities and there is a devolution of power uh, to the state level. So I, I believe ultimately this relationship is defined more than similar, more by similarity than by difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, uh, the president, the prime minister has a lot of He's power, He's the head right? of government, yes. Head of, and then there's the foreign minister. And both the uh, foreign minister and the prime minister have recently paid visits to the United States. That's huh? right, that's right. Our prime minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, was here 
towards the end of September uh, for a working visit. He came to Washington for a very successful meeting with President Obama. And then he went on to New York to address the UN General Assembly. And uh, it was a wonderful visit by any definition. Over the years, uh, what I perceive, uh, and help me with this one, that the, the, the key element that brings the relationship between India and the United States continually forward is trust. Is that, is that a fair statement to say? Absolutely. It's a strategic relationship, a strategic partnership, as we call it, mm -hmm. a very defining partnership. That was those were the words that President Obama used. Absolutely. Didn't he? A, a defining, defining, indispensable partnership for the 21st century, yes. definitely built on trust and sensitivity to each other's concerns. Now, what will each get from this relationship as it moves forward? First of all, it's important that we don't regard this relationship uh, through the prism of being transactional. Uh, obviously, there is give and take in any relationship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there are benefits that accrue to either side when we, uh, when we conduct diplomacy. But I think what we need to look at is the fact that we have shared interests, uh, we have shared values because we are democracies, and we have shared concerns. And what are those concerns? Mm -hmm. The concerns are fighting terrorism, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, the concerns are that we should uh, ensure the security of sea lanes of communication. Mm. The concerns are that uh, we should work together uh, for peace and stability in the world, that we should share notes and, and uh, interact closely on the state of the global economy. There are so many ramifications to this relationship. So it's not just a trade relationship. No, although they say the business of diplomacy is business. Yes. And uh, our trade has grown uh, exponentially in the mm -hmm. last few years. But as Vice President Joe Biden said when he went to India a few months ago, that the potential for this trade and business relationship is nowhere near being realized. You know, we did $100 billion worth of trade in goods and services last year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the potential, we can reach $500 billion if we put our minds and hearts to it. And, and as this grows, as our economies grow further, and as India grows, because, you know, India is a fast-growing, emergent economy. And therefore, there's a lot of potential in that trade and business relationship. I want to go back uh, and, and do a little history with you. The country, uh, great empires, great history, uh, and then all of a sudden in my mind came Great Britain. How did Great Britain get so entrenched in India? Well, that would take a long history lesson, I'm afraid. But uh, the history of India, I mean, essentially, uh, you're looking at 1492. <laughs> And when Christopher Columbus uh, discovered America, he was in search of India and he discovered America. Uh -huh. And there are links, therefore, between what happened here and what happened in India. And the British came as uh, traders and they converted themselves into uh, dominators and, uh, and uh, you know, the progenitors of empire. That is what happened. And what happened to India? I think it's a, an object lesson in terms of uh, how colonialism works. Uh, India, together with China, was one of the leading economies of the world in the 18th century. But by 1947, when we became independent, uh, the state of our economy was in a shambles. Uh, we had been denuded, literally, of our wealth and our uh, resources. And therefore, very few people, I think, understand the challenges that we have faced uh, as an independent country because we have had to build, build literally from ashes, mm. literally from ashes. And therefore, the fact that we have grown phenomenally in the last decade, the fact that we have a huge middle class now, the fact that democracy has taken such strong root in India, and the fact that we have behaved responsibly in the world, I think uh, all goes to show that we worked very, very hard in these last six decades. I want to pick up that thread on the other side. We'll take just a little break. 
uh, and tell the folks at home that we are talking with the ambassador from India to the United States and getting a wonderful lesson in both the history of uh, India and its very special relationship with the United States of America. Sit tight. We'll be back on the other side with Ambassador Rowe. This is America is brought to you by the U.S.-China Education Trust and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing, and distribution services. Madam Ambassador, what happened and what was going on around 1947? Well, we were on the eve of our independence. Mahatma Gandhi was leading our struggle for freedom. And uh, the partition of India was impending also. With independence also came the partition of the subcontinent, as we refer to our region and uh, to uh, India as it used to be in those days. So uh, with the joy of independence also came the trauma of partition. So when I think of 1947, and I think of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and the anguish and the sorrow uh, that was caused to him because of the suffering of people affected by the partition of India. Uh, the, I wasn't born at that time, but from what my parents told me and what I've read in the history books and what I've seen on film, and uh, in, uh, in, the, in the printed records of uh, that time, I understand uh, the kind of turbulence that was caused also. But there was great joy in the fact that we became independent. And if you have heard the speech uh, that uh, our first prime minister, Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru, gave on the eve of our independence, uh, on the midnight before the 15th of August, the Tryst with Destiny speech. It's one of the greatest speeches of all time. Mm -hmm. I think it ranks with Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Mm. So there's a separation of, uh, when you say partition, there's a separation from, uh, from, from India Great was Britain, in a sense carved up. Carved up? Yes. And, and now Pakistan and India. That's right. What was the relationship then and what is the relationship now? Between India and Pakistan? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when you have a family, family feud or when you have uh, two parts of a family uh, getting estranged or growing apart from each other, there will always be issues. There will always be complications. And I think that in many ways defines the relationship between India and Pakistan. But from our point of view, you know, Pakistan is a neighbor, mm -hmm. and uh, we can scarcely choose our neighbors. We cannot row ourselves away to Tierra del Fuego. We have to be there. We have to uh, sit down, both of us, and resolve our problems peacefully. War is never a solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, our policy towards Pakistan is essentially to promote dialogue and uh, facilitate people-to-people exchanges uh, to increase trade and business contact between mm -hmm. our two countries and to look at the larger, more complex problems uh, in, a, in a reasonable manner to sit down and discuss how we can build common ground. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, it's also vital, and I must mention this, that India is very, very insistent and rightly so, that terrorism, which is promoted against us from safe havens within Pakistan, must end. Mm. Because otherwise, the climate for peaceful resolution of our problems uh, will not be there. Both countries are nuclear powers, huh? That's right. 
Is that good news or bad news? Well, I, again, you have to go into the circumstances. Uh, nuclear weapons are never good news. We all know that. Uh, we have to work uh, on a global level to ensure that we achieve complete, universal, non-discriminatory nuclear disarmament. Mm -hmm. And between India and Pakistan, there are a number of confidence-building measures in place to reduce tensions, both at the nuclear level and also at the level of conventional arms. So we have to work in the direction of strengthening those CBMs further. I uh, was uh, kind of surprised that although uh, the United States has cooperated with India in uh, fostering a, a nuclear program, uh, especially in the area of energy, that India does not sign on to the non-proliferation uh, treaties. Uh, we have always regarded that as an unequal discriminatory arrangement uh -huh. and uh, there is really no question of us signing on to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. But what the United States uh, did uh, in 2008 uh, was to work uh, within the nuclear suppliers group to obtain that exception for India. And uh, that was uh, a, a very historic step, if mm -hmm. you ask me, that the United States took. And I think it was uh, predicated on the basic assumption that between India and the United States, uh, we share so much in common in mm -hmm. terms of our aims and our values and our concerns. And that there was also recognition of the fact that India was never a proliferator. India had always acted responsibly when it came to the, to the power and the potential that the nuclear uh, technology holds for any country. And a very clear and, uh, declaration of no first use. Absolutely. And also the civil nuclear cooperation between India and the United States, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. The United States has committed to assisting India in the field of development of civil nuclear energy. And I'll, I'll, say, I'll tell you why, because India is essentially an energy deficient country. Mm. We have about 400 million people in our country that do not have access to commercial energy, to electricity. And we have to be able to develop the sources of clean and green energy. Obviously, we are very sensitive to issues like climate change and sustainable development, which also protects the environment. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. nuclear energy is very important in that context. So uh, one of the things, uh, from an economic point of view, that you would be looking for now would be investment in uh, the infrastructure of in India. Absolutely. Uh, and and, and on underscored in there someplace, energy. Huh? Uh, energy is key. When we talk infrastructure, uh, we think energy, we think airports, we think ports, roads, bridges, and also telecommunication. Mm -hmm. You know, we have 250,000 villages in India which we are going to connect through optic fibers by the end of next year. And that is going to be the backbone on which a national knowledge network is going to be built because we have millions of kids, young people, you know, the median age in India is 28. We're a very young country. Yes. And we have to deliver knowledge. We have to uh, capacitate young people in our country, build skills, and uh, deliver knowledge to all these people. And that's where technology and innovation are so important. Yet at the same time, uh, India is, is known uh, as being a technology center, huh? Yes, because of the IT industry mm -hmm. and because of the fact that we produce thousands of engineers every year. But for a country of 1.2 billion yeah. people, that's still not enough and yeah. we have many people who still live in poverty. I think we must understand that uh, the, uh, the position uh, is very nuanced. It's very, uh, it has many hues and shades in India. On the one hand, you have people who are at the cutting edge Mm -hmm. of innovation, mm -hmm. the best technologists, the best engineers. But on the other hand, you also have millions of people who need to be served, who need to be provided with the capacity and the, and the access uh, to education 
and uh, to a better future. So uh, let's talk culturally for a minute here because uh, clearly one of the great challenges of India is poverty. Huh? That's right. And uh, along with poverty comes this education piece that we're talking about right now and the hope that technology can jump over Absolutely. some of that and start heading in a new direction. You hear this figure of uh, people living on one point twenty-five, uh, $1.25 a day. How many people does that affect in India? Well, it's, it's a good number of people. Let's look at the middle class of the country. You have 1.2 billion people and yes. you have about 350 million people who are middle, middle class. class. And, uh, and, and educated. And educated. Yes. But then the, you have about four to 500, even 600 million people who have to be lifted up oh, out Lord. of poverty. Oh, but let me also tell you that the picture is, again, with India, everything is so mixed. There are states, we have 29 states mm -hmm. in the country. There are some states, some provinces in the country that are, they have a growth rate that has accelerated phenomenally in the last few years. You have some other states where growth is not that great. So we have to look at the mix of regions and, and uh, rates of growth within the country to understand that even though there is poverty in the country, there are some states in India that are doing very well, that have managed to solve their population uh, problem in the terms of the increase of population. In many states it's at replacement level or below replacement level. In some other states we still, there is still work to be done. So it will happen. You know, people are, in fact, are being lifted out of poverty very, very fast because with each percentage rate of growth of the GDP, so many millions of people mm -hmm. get out of poverty. Can you so that's why growth is so important and inclusive growth. Can you put your finger, Madam Ambassador, on what makes one of the states be able to solve their problems and the other states still struggling? Well, a number of factors. Some states, of course, have huge populations. Yeah. There are states that have, you know, 120 million people, 90 million people. That's a huge amount yes. of... Uh, of uh, there are some states that are better endowed in resources. Uh, that uh, have been able to attract foreign investment. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, some states that have paid a great deal of attention to human development. I mean education, uh, I mean health, maternal and child the health. The focus has yes. been in that So direction. it's a mix of all these uh, factors. Mm -hmm. There are lessons to be learned from each of these experiences. Mm -hmm. Does the uh, does the central government learn from the states? Oh yes, and and uh, you know I wonder if you saw this uh, in the latest issue of Foreign Affairs. I think one of the latest issues I saw this uh, piece by Ruchir Sharma. He spoke about the rise of the states in India uh -huh. and how the regions, the states, are coming to really exert a great deal of influence on the conduct of affairs at the national level mm -hmm. and also in uh, determining the direction the country takes. So this is an absolutely new uh, phenomenon that most observers of Indian affairs will have to take into account. And even in foreign affairs, I think the relations at the state to state level, even between states in your country and states in our country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is rising. We were just in Kazakhstan yes. attending this uh, international summit, I guess we would say, on religions from all over oh, the I world. Oh, I see, I see. And two of the folks that we interviewed there were from India. One was representing uh, the Hindu faith, the other the, the uh, uh, Islamic faith. I see. And uh, we got quite an education from the gentleman who presented a very, very... Uh, uh, articulate position on the fact that uh, it's quite easy to call people Islamic extremists but it really but what came away for me was it wasn't really being fair to the religion and what he was basically saying was there were an awful lot of uneducated people who were kind of following some activist leaders 
but didn't really have an understanding of what the faith was all about. Mm -hmm. And he, he pinned it back to education, lack of education. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we have a saying, out of darkness lead me into light. Mm. And knowledge is light, literally. Yes. Knowledge is light. The light of knowledge is what illuminates the future. And uh, it's very, I think we are, it is necessary for us to understand uh, the context in which we talk about religion today. And uh, when it comes to Islam in India, the definition that Islam gave to itself in our subcontinent was... For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, an online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. And now you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This Is America is brought to you by the U.S.-China Education Trust and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing, and distribution services.